Well, welcome everybody. It's good to be back. For I've been missing for a while, paying here, he, him, his. And uh, this is our 59th episode. So it has um, been a while and good to have all of us here in some fashion uh, in some ways. So I'd let uh, the folks here introduce themselves and then go on to what we are going to be talking about today. Actually, we have a really special guest with us joining us on this conversation today on what we're going to talk about. So I'll let the other folks introduce themselves first before we go on. Hello, everyone. My name is Felix Martinez. My pronouns are he, him, and his, and I work for Esperanza United as an engagement, engagement men and boys program specialist, and also I've been part of the network for a long time, so I'm super happy to be here, super excited for this conversation. So, hi, everyone. Hello, uh, my name is Serrano. Can y'all hear me okay? Okay, perfect. My name is Serrano Robinson. Um, I work for Men's Peacemakers here in Duluth, uh, which is a violence prevention agency. Um, I uh, work with the youth, so I'm the Youth Restorative Program Coordinator here at MAP. So thank you for having me. Hey, everybody. My name is Sean Hayes, and my pronouns are he, him, and his. And I am also uh, with Men as Peacemakers up in Duluth. I co-coordinate the Men and Masculine Folks Network here, uh, as well as I work in a program called the Don't Buy It Project, coordinating that. So really excited to be back and have Pang back and have Seth joining us as well. Yeah, and my name is Seth. I use he, him, his pronouns. Thanks so much for letting me hop into the conversation here. Um, I am the Health Promotion and Violence Prevention Program Manager at the University of St. Thomas in St. Paul, Minnesota. I just started there in August, so finishing up my first academic year um, at the university. Before that, I was in grad school. Before that, I worked um, at the Southwest Crisis Center, which services five counties in Southwest Minnesota, and they're a dual um, sexual violence and relationship domestic violence victim advocacy organization. So some background in um, survivor advocacy, and I also did prevention work um, out there in Southwest Minnesota. So yeah, excited to be here and join in on the conversation today. Thanks, Seth, and everybody else as well to my fellow siblings and comrades who are often here always. Again, this is for those of you who are joining us, uh, this is always an organic space and conversation for us as men and masculine folks to really dive in deeper into our understanding and our navigation of the complexity and the nuances of what it means to be a man or what it means to be masculine in our own lives and how we can sort of shape new meanings around that. And these conversations are really designed in that way you know, where there is no intended agenda on it uh, other than that these conversations are created for those kinds of spaces and those kinds of new meanings and uh, new concepts to form itself or to come about and that we uh, talk in these ways uh, that may, we know that men and masculine folks normally would not have these kinds of conversations. So we definitely always welcome those of you, uh, you who are joining us live to join, ask questions of our guests as well too, of any one of us about anything that we talked about. And for those of you who are joining us after our live, live session, feel free to always comment and um, share as well too. Uh, and uh join our conversations or come and be a guest and have a conversation with us um, as well too. So we always enjoy that and uh, always look forward to having folks join us in the conversation. So maybe we can go a little bit back to uh, Seth, talk about, maybe share a little bit about um, what you find uh, in terms of like meaningful in, in the work that you're doing on college campuses and sort of like how you fell into uh, the work that, however we define the work, right? Um, but but really the work uh, is so big and so broad in terms of gender-based violence. Uh, and so if you could share a little bit about that and we can go from there. Yeah, absolutely. So it really all started for me um, when I was an undergrad at Syracuse University in upstate New York. 
And um, I happened to kind of fall into a women's and gender studies course because it fit into my schedule and it was like a writing intensive class that I needed and um, ended up really enjoying it. Got to know the professor a little bit. She encouraged me to take more classes. And there were two big kind of realizations that I had through those courses and, um, and subsequent conversations. One was you mean I could just go through life not having to prove to everyone how manly I am all the time? Um, as this idea of, oh, so many of the ways that I walk through the world that I hide certain aspects of myself with certain people or that I pretend to like things that I don't or that I pretend that I don't like things that I really do like or whatever, you know, the clothes that I'm wearing, everything really when I started to unpack that, how much of this is just me performing and learning about the socialization of gender, like all of that kind of stuff uh, really came together for me in undergrad. So that was a big part that I was motivated kind of for myself of, okay, I'd love to be able to just find something that feels more authentic to me without kind of proving how tough and manly I am constantly. And then the other part was just, understanding the reality of rape culture, especially on college campuses, um, learning more about the data and statistics behind that, but also hearing stories from classmates and friends of mine who had experienced sexual violence within college, um, who had reported to the university and lost their Title IX case or nothing happened or they didn't feel comfortable reporting because they know that other students had negative experiences. Um, and so that was all something that I felt really motivated to, you know, be a part of the solution, especially because I was really involved on campus. I was a tour guide and orientation leader and all that kind of stuff. And so I knew a lot of the administrators and it just seemed weird to me that this, that that rape culture was alive and well at Syracuse even though I knew that administrators, a lot of them were well-meaning and well-intentioned, but just showed kind of the, the bigger system that um, is so hard to, to eradicate. Uh, so those are the two things that really got me interested and it felt like a place where um, I could make an impact and I knew that we needed more men working in sexual violence prevention and needed more um, uh, exposure of the reality that the vast majority of gender-based violence, sexual violence in particular, is caused by men. And so let's try to get to the root cause of that rather than, you know, the kind of previous generation of prevention work being more risk reduction, teaching people how to protect themselves, that kind of thing. Um, yeah, so all of that kind of led me up to working, like I mentioned, at the Crisis Center and then now my work at St. Thomas. Um, which is really around, I do a lot of stuff around healthy masculinity. We have a monthly workshop that kind of builds on itself. We call it the Man Enough series. And then I'm also doing, you know, healthy relationship workshops, bystander intervention, consent education, all that kind of stuff too. And what I find really meaningful is when you can tell that other men, particularly young men, are yearning to have these conversations. Um, I find that that so often that if you create the space, if you invite people in, if you, you know, find some opportunity to have this conversation like we are today, a lot of times I've been surprised how many men like are, were waiting for that, want to do that, uh, have experiences that they want to share from their own life. But it's hard to be the one to kind of bring that up because of that socialization and how men are, you know, supposed to talk about our feelings and it's hard to be vulnerable and everything like that. So that's been really meaningful so far in my time in St. Thomas when I've been able to create those spaces and then finding that reaction from men or masculine college students who are like, thank you for doing this. I'm so glad we're able to talk about this today. There aren't a lot of spaces where I'm able to do this. Um, that feels really good and hopefully is leading towards culture change on campus as well. Yeah. 
Yes, thank you, Seth, for sharing that. I think it's always interesting to to talk to the men, masculine folks who are privileged to do this work uh, and invited to do this work, to really hear how you came into it uh, and how you are staying in it and then how you're actually living out these values, right, and living out what we would call like a feminist and a queer life uh, and what does that really mean uh, for for you as an individual. And so that story really resonates. I think one of the things that I, I can connect with was uh, when you were like, uh, had to take the course because you needed the course or mm-hmm. because it was fulfilling for something. And I remember doing a workshop years ago um, at at a national conference and uh, I was trying to promote our workshop outside of the doors. And I was trying to get a lot of the young men that were in the space to come into the workshop. And one of the uh, young men that I had talked to was like, oh, I'm looking for this financial literacy workshop. And I was like, I think you want to come in here first because you're not going to get to financial literacy until you understand domestic violence in our community, right? And sexual violence in our community and what's happening. And he was like, oh, okay. So I didn't know he had come into the workshop until at the end when he came and talked to me. And he was like, yeah. And I was like, oh, you did come into the workshop. And he was like, I'm so glad I actually came. Because the privilege of being men in community and masculine in the community is that we don't see these things, right? Exactly to your point of like, oh, I didn't know I didn't need to act tough. That I didn't need to do that, right? Um so that, that just reminded me of that, of like how some of us, I think, sort of step into this, thinking that it's like um, that we needed to do it or that it was a feel good thing. But it's actually much more than that. And I think that that's the value in these kinds of stories. When we share these stories is it is about our livelihood and it is about uh, who we are as individuals and it is about the kind of community and the kind of society that we want to be in and the kinds of relationship that we want men and masculine folks to be a part of uh, and really connect with and i think i connect so deeply with uh you, you when you talked about like the craving for these kinds of spaces uh amongst and between uh men and masculine folks in community uh because so so many of the time the kinds of conversations we've seen are not like this right um and are not designed in these ways as well too so there's a specific intentionality in the way in which we design these spaces and these conversations uh in this very particular way and i think sometimes um we're pushed as men and masculine folks to not have these kinds of really intimate and vulnerable conversations about who we are and where we're coming from and why we're doing this um, and why it matters to us. I I think that that is the part that, and it matters to us not because we have, I know for me, not because we have sisters and uh, queer folks in our lives, but it is much more than that. It has to be much more than that. I think over the years I've learned that it, it couldn't just be that because that that tie and that relationship alone itself uh, wasn't going to stop the violence that I saw in community, mm-hmm. right, towards women and queer folks, um, that I, I needed to uh, make sure that it wasn't just a certain group of queer people or femme people or women folks that got, that didn't receive the violence, but it had to be like the totality and all women and all queer folks not actually experiencing that violence. And I think that that's what I know, at least for me, is so dearly important about um, the meaning of this work and why I stay in it. Yeah, to your point about um, kind of men yearning to have these conversations, another thing that I've done outside of my jobs, uh, when I was in grad school, I would organize what we called deconstructing masculinity dinners. Um, and it's kind of like kitchen table conversations. Um, it also came up from um, seeing some stuff that Justin Baldoni was doing with his Man Enough uh, project. They have a podcast now, Man Enough podcast. And um, I was realizing that I was in my work in grad school, I would talk with people all the time about healthy masculinity, about being vulnerable. But then when I would hang out with my guy friends, my group of friends that I've been friends with, even for a long time, 
we were still talking about sports and beer and whatever. And so I thought, well, I got to start living this in my life too. And not just when I go to work. Um, and so I would just have my friends over for dinner. I usually have some kind of question to kind of get the conversation started. So sometimes it would be, Hey, when was the last time that you cried? Sometimes it would be, um, did your parents have the talk with you about sex and relationships? Did they talk about consent? Um, you know, if you have kids or you want to have kids, how do you want to have that conversation with them? And it was just meant to be fun and casual and have a little bit of intentional space to be vulnerable and talk about some of those, those topics. And there was one person in particular in our friend group who I was kind of nervous to invite nervous that they just wouldn't want to do it, that they're, it's not really their thing. Um, but eventually we got him to come and he participated in the conversation had really interesting things to say. I got to know him better um, because of things that he shared. And then, you know, message us afterwards, say, hey, thanks so much. That was really great conversation. I enjoyed it. Looking forward to the next one. So I think it really is if you're able to create those conversations, people that even you don't necessarily expect uh, might surprise you with how much they were hoping to have that conversation or how much they got out of it. So I think that's a, a big lesson that I've learned over the last couple of years um, to, to just try to do that more, invite people in, be welcoming, make it a, a comfortable space. And then it helps engage with men a lot better. Yeah, thank you for sharing that, Seth. I love... Uh, to see, you know, when, you know, these spaces are done intentionally, you know, to have this conversation, to open the space, to have conversation about masculinity, also self-care, mental health, a lot of things that men don't normally talk about, you know, things are very important and help us create a base to to be better men, better father, better brothers, etc. So I, I really enjoy listening to that just because me as a man, I, I, I never had this type of conversation since till I was uh, invited to to be in the retreat with the Men and Masculine Folks Network. I, I probably could hear things here and there, but doing it intentionally and being in that point where I was alone and listening for first time and and all that stuff going through my head being a father of two daughters, obviously all that changed my life, something that I'm very grateful. But I would love to hear from you, Seth, how, how all these knowledge have changed your life, especially with relationships, you know, with, with, with partners, how before and after, how, how, how would that have changed you, you know? Because obviously, you know, we, we, we listen, we hear from the society how men are supposed to behave, how, how we're supposed to treat women, even sometimes we see it something different at home. But how was your experience with that? How 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 this work have changed your life in your relationships? Yeah. Yeah. I mean, it's it's been interesting kind of going through this work at the time in my life that I have because uh even when I was in college, I would think back on like high school relationships and thinking about consent and like, yeah, we never had that language for it. At least there was some language about, well, I don't want to make somebody uncomfortable or put pressure or something. But um, I started to think back about that. And then for a long time, I was like uh, teaching about healthy relationships, both to high schools and middle schools, and now mostly with college students. Um, and then it was that, okay, I got to make sure that I'm like also living those same healthy characteristics in my own life. Um, I think a big part of it was kind of that feminist education that I got in undergrad after taking that first class, I ended up being a women's and gender studies minor. Um, and, you know, just learning so much about systems of oppression in the world, all the different types of privilege that I have, the ways that my own lived experience is different than other people uh, with with other identities. And 
that's informed a lot, like the way that I show up in relationships and know that, that my experience is going to be different. Um, yeah, I think it's, it's also changed now because I'm in a relationship now that, you know, is relatively new. We've been dating for the last eight months or so, nine months. And, um, and that's been kind of concurrent, like the same timeline as my job here at St. Thomas, which has been great. And so there's a lot of things that um, I'll think about at work and then I'll think, oh, how does this dynamic come up in, in my relationship or vice versa? Um, and yeah, I mean, ultimately it just comes down to like the importance of being vulnerable, communicating with your partner. Uh, it's really easy to talk in a workshop with a bunch of college students about how you should be vul more vulnerable and um, share your feelings with your partner and, you know, and then you go home and feel that sense of reluctance and tension. You think, okay, I know I, how am I feeling or what is the, like the need that's making me feel frustrated and how do I express that need in a, in a compassionate way? Um, so it has been really good. Uh, I think doing this type of work, like, is really beneficial for everybody, both kind of on a macro level of putting out healthy relationship skills, having conversations about um, about that, the, the other, and also like on a micro level in, in your own interpersonal life. I think those things are helpful. The other thing that's been interesting, I also, um, part of the Southwest Crisis Center, uh, my work there, after I left that job to go to grad school, Few years later, they reached out to me because they were starting up a uh, domestic abuse transformation program, um, which we use the Duluth model. So very much at home with Menace Peacemakers. And uh, and they were doing a Zoom class of that. Uh, so it's a, it's a non-violence program for men who most of them have, you know, had some kind of criminal involvement with domestic assault. And this class is part of their probation or parole or something. And so I've been a co-facilitator for that group on Zoom. Uh, I think we're going on two years now. Um, and that's always been really interesting hearing about the participants' lives, their relationships, um, being able to talk about that with my partner now, um, obviously keeping everybody's confidentiality, but talking about themes and things that I'm learning and um, and seeing how yeah, just how those dynamics play out at different levels and intensities and communication styles and everything. So um, that was kind of a broad answer, but I think it really is beneficial always to uh, be able to learn what you're doing in professional life and, and apply it to your own relationships too and, um, and the opposite, so. I was just waiting to see if Serrano was going to pop in or not. Um, yeah, I gosh, I am relating to a lot of what you're sharing um, and thinking about that piece around um, really practicing what we preach, I guess, that, you know, that phrase. Um, and, and also just remembering back to like how I very similarly sort of stumbled into this movement, um, you know, seven, seven ish years ago or eight years ago, um, when I took a class that was free that Menace Peacemakers was offering the Don't Buy It project. Um, and so I'm just, I'm just like thinking about that piece. Like, it seems like a lot of us sort of maybe stumbled into this work or we were, uh, we or family members or friends were somehow impacted by violence and got here. And I'm also thinking about the fact that, you know, a lot of the guys that I talk with very similarly are sort of yearning for more opportunities, more spaces like this to have the conversation. Um, and yet, you know, that balance of like the desire, knowing that like we can be better, 
we want to be better in how we show up in our relationships and, and in our families and communities and also acknowledging like that that is there's some hard work there that needs to be done some deeper you know reflection like what you said like thinking about past relationships and thinking about how you've shown up um and then like making that shift right and really starting to practice these new healthy ways of masculinity um i love that you brought up that the man enough podcast because i was just listening to an episode um just i think last week um where they were interviewing a trans uh masculine actor and just hearing his story and um and so i guess this is just kind of all you know i'm processing as i'm talking but it, it's it's really cool to know that you know like this is my first time meeting you seth but like you have these stories of people who want the spaces who show up and even though it's a little bit scary at first like they keep showing up right and so it's like i'm just thinking how do we you know as men and masculine folks really create more spaces where folks have that opportunity they see the opportunities you know i mean that's always something i'm kind of thinking about is how can we reach more folks how can we connect more mask people in um because once we're in you know it's it feels like for each of us here on this call it, it has been revolutionary in our own personal development and growth as humans um and so yeah just just one of those things that i'm thinking like it's so cool to connect with more mask people doing this work um it gives me hope that you know this is possible prevention of violence is possible um, as we work to change the ways that we show up and the people we're connected with. And so there's not really a question there, I guess, just sharing appreciation that like this is hard work, I think, for men who haven't really ever taken the time to think about their privilege or the ways that they're showing up for partners or families. Um, it's hard to do that. And also it just feels so healing, you know, in my experience, um, to be making those kinds of shifts. And so, you know, I'll pause there, but. Yeah, I like what you said about kind of the entry points and how a lot of people, a lot of men come into this work, come into this consciousness from different ways. And yeah, that's kind of how I've thought of it too. And my hope is, and my goal is to provide multiple entry points for different people in in all the communities that I'm part of. Um, and so sometimes the entry point is a mandated 26 week class that you have to go to. And I can tell you with the two years that we've been doing it, there has we haven't had any volunteers who just want to come for 26 weeks because they heard about it. Uh, but pretty much everybody, once they're they've gone through it all, they're like, you know, there were a lot of things that I really benefited from. And it was really cool to have this community where we can uh, share what was going on in our lives. And I don't have very many people where I can even just talk about the struggles that I'm having, you know, in my relationship and my job, whatever. Um, and I know like another resource for people to check out, I watched a, a documentary available on YouTube, the feminist in cell block Y, um, which is a, you know, another touch point for people who are incarcerated. Um, and it was a, a workshop program uh, there where they could entry point into kind of feminist consciousness and, and healthy masculinity conversations. Um, and then, yeah, sometimes it's just bringing your friends over for dinner. So that's one thing I'm doing, I think, that everybody can kind of think about what are the touch points, entryways that we could create. Um, it doesn't have to be like traveling all over the place and bringing people in. It could just be people that you're in community with in some way already. So. And I'm just kind of uh, like processing as well, but I'm, I got like a question and a half towards the end of this process. Um, one, thank you. I think, I think, thank you just for being here. I think as far as like flowers too, like thank you for being somebody that like kind of understood where you were at and like the challenges that had to be for you to go to get to where you're going. I think like 
now that I just thought about it, like being on this call, like thank all of you. I think like as a, as as a man myself, like as somebody who like kind of have seen and been a lot of a part of a lot of the violence, like I don't think we also like give ourselves credit. So I will give y'all credit. Thank y'all for choosing. Thank y'all for challenging. Thank y'all for doing the work. Um, I know for a lot of us, like once the once the corner turned, it was kind of like regular stuff. Like, but I still want to appreciate y'all for that. Um, I think you're absolutely right, Sean. Um, when I think about like kind of how you come into this work, like you kind of for me, I kind of stumbled into it. But then once you stumble into it, you kind of have so many tied values to it to the point where you can't leave. Like um, whether you want to, whether you don't, you know, um, you know, whether it's my mom, you know, who has been through a lot of like violence or my siblings who have got to see a lot of violence um, or be separated from my mom due to violence. Um, whether it's my grandma, my aunts, my uncles, just kind of watching people kind of like be affected by violence is something that once I noticed, I was like, okay, this is something that I cannot just walk away from, right? Like that's kind of bullshit to just be like, yeah, I know this exists. I know that I am a part of it, but I'm not going to do anything. So that's why I also like appreciate y'all because it is a choice. You know, I'm somebody who who, who talks really deeply and really honestly. Um, it is a choice. There are people who know and still don't, right? So that was my like little envision of coming into this work was I definitely stumbled across it. And then I was like, oh no, my mom was definitely affected by that. I have definitely made women feel like this. I have definitely made girls feel like this. I, I have a role. Like <laughs> There's no if, ands, or buts. I have a role in this situation right now. Um, and obviously throughout your life, your role changes, right? As you get older, as you understand yourself, the people around you. Um, so I think that's just like clear to say um, is that, yeah, once you stumble into this, it's kind of like once you know, you know, you know, and I hope and I wish men kind of like have more of that. Like, I don't even like just self-encouragement, you know, to kind of get themselves into this work, like understanding, of course, it's going to be like tough and it's easier for like to have a to have a, a partner or a friend kind of help you walk you walk you into it. But I'm going to speak some honesty into the men, too. You know, it's like once you know, you know, you know, once you get that one breath of like realizing what women actually go through, once you get that one breath of realizing what you do to people now is that that moment right there should be a stopping point. That should be the point where transition starts. Now, it's not going to be easy, right? Nothing is, right? We've been on this earth for so long to know that nothing is easy. So it's not. But I think it's very beneficial. You know, it's worth it. It's tough, but it's needed. Like, I, I want to say, like, I love the person I've become. I don't hate the person I was, though. And that's also not going to push anything forward. Um, I just had to challenge the person that I was. But I love the person that I am today. The person that asks questions. The person that cares. The person that thinks before. I act, I speak. The person that cares more about their feelings than mine, even in any situation. Um, so I think that's kind of how I came into this. And my question is, it's kind of like a two part. Um, have you always worked with college folks around this? And how has the, and if, if you have, um, why, why college age? Is, is it something that you chose? Is it something like um, was kind of just given to you? Is something like was kind of forced to put into your lap? Um, why, yeah, why college age? Yeah, thanks for, for sharing that and, and holding space for that, Serrano. Um, I have not always worked with college students. I originally, once I graduated from college, working at the crisis, Southwest Crisis Center, I was working mostly with high school and middle school students. We did some um, with the, the community and technical college in the area. Um, and I think that work was great. And I certainly believe that we need to be having conversations about healthy relationships and consents and masculinity at early ages. And there's very much like age appropriate ways to do that. Um, I just found for myself, I was enjoying doing this work with older students, with high schools and, and especially college students. And maybe part of that was kind of, that was my entry point into all of this was when I was in college. Um, and so that was something that I, I intentionally looked for and sought out, um, not necessarily because it, it was like what I thought was the most important or the, you know, that we should be having these conversations more with college students than we should with high school students. But it was kind of thinking about what is going to be sustainable for me to continue this work and still be kind of, uh, energized and, and enthusiastic about it. And I was, I thought, I think working with college students. Um, so that was kind of my motivation for going to grad school and getting some of that knowledge and, uh, and skills necessary to be able to work on a college campus. 
The other thing I like about it is it's kind of a, a self-contained environment and it can feel a little bit easier to make institutional or policy change within one college than it is like at the state or federal level. Um, and you can kind of see some of those impacts a little bit quicker, easier, more tangibly. So um, that was another draw for me, even though there's plenty of bureaucracy and hurdles to get over to make college-wide or university-wide policy changes too. But, um, but yeah, that's kind of what attracted me to the work and being able to have those a little bit more conversations that feel like talking with peers um, with college students, you know, was something that drew me in as well. I think you may have talked about this a little bit, Seth, but could you share some of the challenges that you've faced and um, for yourself and then like what you've learned from that um, around this work and once you fully sort of understood uh, this work uh, more in depth, you know, and you, you saw like the deeper pieces of the iceberg. Uh, some mm -hmm. of the challenges and some of the lessons that you're learning. Yeah. Um, I mean, it's always a challenge and a lifelong journey process of like recognizing how uh, my identities and my position in the world allow me to have a certain experience that other people don't, privileges and power that come with that. Um, and on top of all those kind of identities that we often talk about, you know, me being a white cis man, um, I'm also like extroverted and, um, naturally kind of take up a lot of space. Uh, and so learning to kind of listen and know when to step up, try to advocate for voices that need to be advocated for that or amplify voices that I, I think are going to help us get to the, the root causes of structural violence. Um, but also knowing when to kind of be like, okay, this is not my turn to talk. Um, you know, and, and that shows up in my work. It also shows up in my relationship, like definitely still working on listening. Um, I'll tell you one, small story, but, uh, so my girlfriend and I like to do puzzles together and for, I think Valentine's day. Yeah. We, I was trying to think of like what kind of gift I should get her. And somehow I had this idea of getting her like a puzzle board. Um, so it's this like board that has drawers in it so you can sort the different pieces and you can like put it up on top of a table or you could set it up on legs on the floor if you want. And then you, if you get halfway through, but you need to like clean up, you can move it somewhere else and everything. <clears throat> and then I gave it to her and I thought, oh, look at me. I got this great gift. It's something that we like doing together. I, you know, I know that she loves puzzles and I got her a gift based on that. Like, good job, Seth. And then eventually come to realize that she already had one that was like technically her friends, but really like she had it. And she had definitely told me that before, which is probably what put the idea in the back of my brain to begin with. And I had just not processed that, not like listened deeply enough or whatever to, to realize that. So then I'm all embarrassed and, you know, kind of have the opposite feelings of, oh, I'm not a good enough partner and I need to like really. And so we just had some good conversations about it. And um, it's kind of my, my status quo is to like speed through things to uh, often be the one who's like, talking about how my day was instead of asking questions about how her day was and that kind of thing. And so, yeah, 
I don't think that's something that I can be like, all right, I have figured out, I fixed that and now we're good. It's just going to be, I got to keep kind of reminding myself to slow down and really be like deeply listening and, you know, maybe make little notes for myself of like, Hey, she mentioned this. I'm going to remember that for the future, whatever. So that's just one example of the ways that, and all of that is connected to the ways that men are taught how to be and that, you know, on a broader level, like are what we want matters more or, you know, what are my goals in life? What are my career aspirations? I should be able to accomplish those. Um, you know, if I'm a little kid who's extroverted and always answering questions that I'm a future leader and I'm praised for that. Um, but not necessarily if I'm in the background listening and taking everything in. And so it's figuring out, okay, you learn about all these broad structures and we have these conversations about how gender is a social construct. And I think there's a lot of that vocab that's becoming more familiar now. And then like you said, Serrano, it's kind of like once you see it, you can't unsee it. And it, having that process of, okay, I know how these systems are impacting my own life and I need to recognize that and then make the choice to like counteract that, push against it, do what I can to not fall into that. Um, so I think it's it's a struggle, but it's also like that's just kind of part of how life is and part of the work. Um, and then, so that's kind of on a, on a personal level, there's all sorts of challenges that I could get into too, like on a professional level, doing this work, getting, um, getting buy-in from people above me, getting resources, you know, showing that sexual violence is an issue on college campuses when we don't necessarily have a lot of reports um all those different systems that are that are big and insidious and hard to get to the root cause of um but i think that's just kind of thinking of creative ways and developing partnerships and everything like that I'm just thinking about the listening piece that you talked about. I feel like that is kind of one of the first things that I sort of realized or with the help of my women and femme folk friends helped to see that within myself. You know, you talked about how much space we take up and, and we're sort of taught as men to take that space up and to hold it and to, you know, keep others out of that, you know, in a very like sort of, I don't know, ultimately, I think selfish kind of way where, you know, like, it makes me think about um, when I was learning about this, and I'm still not great at <laughs> deeply listening, it is it is a continued struggle and a practice to do that for me. Um, but I just, yeah, I just remember, I had a moment where it was like, I really am not hearing my partner, like, I I don't really know like how she feels um, on the day to day, you know, with like even just like household stuff, like splitting those things up and having conversations about that. And I would just come into every conversation and like sort of hear what she was saying. But then it was like at the same time in my brain, I'm like, OK, how do I fix this? How am I going to respond to this? And not being fully like focused on, um, you know, like that is a way that we as men and masculine folks can show that deep care is like to really practice like pausing the inner dialogue that is happening, um, trying to push pause on that, that like, I think just instinct that we have to um, think about, well, how does this impact me? How does what I'm hearing make me feel, you know, and it's like, okay, hold on. <laughs> this, this is not about me at all. Um, and gosh, I think it really, for me, came down to like, how much am I valuing 
the people in my life. You know, I say that these people are my friends. I say, you know, we have these titles, girlfriend, partner, wife, you know, whatever it is. Um, and it's like, gosh, I think just, I tend to really value myself and like what I want and what I need in life. And I think that is totally a part of how we're learned to show up or taught to show up. Um, and it's like, sort of just like, how do we make that switch? Like we care about the folks in our lives, but like, how do we learn to care more deeply, to listen more deeply, to really try to empathize with like the experience of them folks, um, I don't know that. Like I'm, it's, you know, not rhetorical for sure. Like jump in anybody. And I know that we're also sort of coming to the end of our time here today. Um, but it's, it's real difficult for me still. And I, you know, I've been doing this work and I've known about deep active listening, you know, for a long time and, and I still really struggle. And so I don't know, it feels important to, put that out there and just like, be honest, like, I'm not good at this most of the time. Um, but I feel like when I'm able to be honest about that, like with y'all, with um, the guys in my life, it's like, oh, there's, there's shared, you know, people understand that, like, I think we all sort of have those similar struggles. And it, it's encouraging to me to hear about them and to hear the encouragement from folks who are maybe a little further in their journey of healthy masculinity and also those folks who can be like, Sean, don't try to fix it. Don't try to <laughs> stop what you're doing. You know, that's your habit. Stop that. Um, so I just appreciate this conversation a lot. I think what you said about uh, note, like knowing that we really care but then the question is, okay, what are the actions that we're taking to show that we care? And, you know, I've heard a lot of men talk about how much they care for their family or, you know, oh, uh, there was a guy hitting on my wife in a bar. I'm going to go beat him up because I care about her so much. And it's this kind of protective, possessive kind of actions. And then you think about, okay, well, if if that's the the care that you have that you want your partner's boundaries to be respected what are the actions that are going to show up for her in a way that she would want you to show up um and do you care enough about her to do the dishes instead of doing all of the manly things that make you feel like this superhero guy who who saved your partner, whatever. So I think a lot of it is, yeah, figuring out what are those ways that we can express that care and love that we have for the people in our lives. And can we align that with the ways that they want, that they're asking for us to show up for them? Right. It's almost like, it's almost like caring like deeply too. So I appreciate what both of you are saying. It's like, I feel like as men, we're like, we care conditionally and circumstantially, like to the point where we win and it's fucked up. And I, again, I apologize for my um, for, for my language, but it's like we care to the point of where we succeed. And that's like the most heartbreaking thing I can ever like see in myself and see in the people around me. Like, so that was a beautiful point that you both have made, like just about caring. Like, it's like, do you care about her or do you care about, like, how do I frame this? Do you care about her or do you care about how you look caring about her? Like, does that make sense? Like, and it's almost like we are more infatuated with the actual thought and like the, the 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 social aspect and all that bullshit, and we're not actually invested in who the person is in front of us, right? Because to your point, like when you're going to like let's say you're going to beat somebody up because they said something to your partner, like you know damn well that's not what your partner wants, and you know for a fact that it could have took you to care more and listen more to be like okay, although that may have upset me, right? Although I know that I love you, I gotta do what she also wants as well because she actually was the one that was disrespecting. She was the one that was you know, kind of not listen to and, and and done wrong at that moment. So I think as men, we definitely should be better at, like like you said, like caring to the point of where we're caring about the actual person and not how we seem. We have too much more, like, we have, yeah, too much care about how we're seen. And then that just, like, fucks it up, too. Um, and then, like, the listening part as well, it's like, I love what both of you talked about, about active listening. 
I feel like as men too, we just literally just be listening to respond. Like it's like both of them. Like we don't listen to care. We also just literally just just be responding to shit. Like I'll be talking to people like men in my life, and like you ever talk to somebody, you can tell that they're not paying attention to what you're saying. Now take that and like imagine how somebody who like intimately loves you and wants you to connect. Like I can only imagine a fraction of that. I can only imagine a fraction of that of how they would feel. Um, so I think definitely being better about I call it like listening to give a shit because you like you're listening to learn. Mm. Like I've had that in my life too. So I like you know. I love that y'all being vulnerable and I'm at this table too. Like I've had times in my intimate life where, you know, I thought, you know, talking about the colors and what she likes and, you know, listening, like that's all some dumb shit and that's some soft shit. And it's like, no, okay, then let's fast forward it to the point where on your birthdays and Valentine's Day, I don't know what to get you. Oh yeah. That's not her problem. That's a me problem. Like that's a problem that I didn't get a chance to listen to, you know? So I think like, I appreciate you being vulnerable in that sense, Seth. And I've also just been through the same things where it's like, am I listening to care? It's like, no, I'm listening just to pass the time, to be very honest. Like, just because I can, too, you know, men are primed to be, be the person to, like, have the last word, right, respond last, and not even hear other people, you know, and, and especially intimate partners. So I just appreciate y'all just kind of talking about the listening um, in the caring part, because I, I know for damn sure, like, I've had equations where I'm like, okay, I don't know what she likes, and it's literally because I didn't listen well. Or I didn't ask those questions, or I thought talking about shapes and colors was stupid. Like, if you like, if you talk about those things, that's gonna create literally a mold for you to know what to do for that person. Like, literally, if I know your color right now, I know what type of flowers, what type of sweater. Like, I, I struggle with gifts, so that question itself kind of I felt like I felt attacked because <laughs> I was like, <laughs> do I just not listen to nobody? Like, oh, um, but not in all seriousness. Like, I think you're absolutely right. Like, we gotta do better at like listening to care. And also caring to care, like not caring to have anything come behind you, but caring to where like our partners might might not even have to say anything anymore. Like, why do they even have to tell us certain things, right? Like instead of doing the manly or what we say manly like tasks, do what she asked you to do. Like, and I'll ask people like, and they'll be like, oh, why should I do this? I'm like, because you love me, right? Like, what the fuck? Why are we even putting question marks on when some? Because you know we love to do that as men. Why do I gotta do that? Because the person you say you love asks you to. That's that shouldn't be anything bigger than that. Like, why do we gotta keep escalating the reasons why we listen to our partner? That should be as thin as it can be, right? It's I'm listening because, and I'm doing this because the person I love told me to, or they asked of me. We forget that favors are part of love too, and we fuck up right away when we're like, no, I'm supposed to be doing the garbage. And the, it's like, no, she's asking you that probably because she has a lot going on. And again, if you're caring, if you're listening, you'll hear that. All right, bet, babe, I got you. No matter what, whatever you want me to do, I got you. But instead, we go to the social cues of how am I going to be looked at doing dishes in my Crocs, right? Or how am I going to be looked at doing laundry in my pink shirt or doing laundry in my dirty sweats? It's like you care more about how other people feel. And it's sad because the only person that's really being hurt or the the the, the deepest person that's being hurt is your partner by it. So I just appreciate y'all talking about like listening and caring in that way. Yeah, I think that's something, one of those things as a man we need to probably put more focus on. Uh, I've been with my partner work for 24 years and haven't been easy. You know, it's something that you keep learning. Uh, marriage is never perfect, something that we need. But as men, we need to also understand what's a healthy relationship. You know, having boundaries is not a bad thing. Sometimes when you put boundaries in a relationship, people think it's like you're trying to distance yourself from that person that you love or you care when it's not. You're trying to create a space where everybody have you know, the, the opportunity to to have their own time, to, to have a better understanding, to listen with intention. So I think that's a, that's a point that I was happy you guys brought because as a man, sometimes we lack of that part just because men are not supposed to show feelings. One of those things that we teach, you know, the men, men are always supposed to be strong. You know, if you're crying, you're showing that you're weak when it's not. So uh, very happy to bring in something that I always bring to my spaces when I'm talking to other men. And, and, and the young folks, just because we need to create spaces that are safe. And when we're having these conversations with our partners, with our friends, we need to create that, you know, trust. So people talk with intention, with care, and we can create more, you know, spaces that are based in love and respect, something that's well needed nowadays, considering how crazy the world is right now with so much, uh, you know, 
they you know if, if you're adding divided and you know there's some gun problems politics you know the world is, is pretty bad for us for as adults just imagine the youth what they're going through so we need to do things with intention and and men we we have this opportunity to change and and, and be more meaningful in our relationship and and as a man so Well, I'll just hop in too. I, uh, something you had said, Serrano, made me remember this TikTok I saw. TikTok uh, has taught me so much. Uh, and it's people just sharing things, right? Sharing mm -hmm. what they know on TikTok. And I saw this TikTok where it was like, you know, you think you're being helpful by asking, hey, what can I do to help you? What do you need help with? Rather than looking around and seeing the dirty dishes in the sink seeing that the trash can is overflowing and taking care of that, right? Rather than putting on that additional um, work, you know, to our to our femme and women partners and, and people we love. So I was just, that struck me. And that is something I need to work on myself yeah. as well. But um, yeah, I just talk wanted to throw it out there. If Peng or Seth have um, any final thoughts as we're coming to the end of our time here. Well, just to your last point, we talk a lot about that in the, the men's group that I co-facilitate about kind of the role in a relationship where oftentimes one person is kind of the manager, the task manager who knows in their head, here's all the things that need to get done. And then the other person is like, oh yeah, if you tell me to do something, I'll do it, right? But it, it takes a job to be the one that has everything in their head about, okay, so-and-so needs to be picked up from practice. We need to go to the grocery store, get this business. And I saw a list on Reddit recently that my brother actually told me about that was like kind of asking dads in particular, go through this list and how many of these things do you know? And it was like, your, your child's teacher's name, uh, three things that your child likes to eat and doesn't like to eat. What's in the fridge right now? You know, like, your child's best friend and a place that they like to go after school, like on and on, when is their next doctor's appointment? And there's so many things like that, that it's easy to think, oh, I'm a really supportive partner. I, I don't complain about doing stuff. Um, but can you create it so that you're truly a partner where both people are, are the ones figuring out, okay, these are all the things that need to get done and I'm an active participant in that. Um, and so I think that's one place that we can kind of continue to build on because um, it's one thing to talk about, hey, I know what are, what are healthy and unhealthy characteristics. I know what are you know, ways to like set up boundaries and I wanna respect my partner's boundaries and everything. But um, that's one thing I'm gonna try to do next academic year is go a little bit beyond that conversation and into this, how do we really create more equitable relationships? Um, and some of the things that we talked about, about showing up for our, our partners and our friends and our, you know, family in ways that they want in, in the way that they want us to show up for them. Um, so I think, yeah, that's a big, big thing that I'm kind of pushing forward now. So. Yeah, I just want to, uh, appreciate all of you for this conversation and again Seth for coming on um, and give my closing thoughts here before Sean uh, ends us here uh, I think you know one of the things that I want to lift up in this conversation uh, in the course of this conversation especially towards the end here is that you know the counter argument might be but but my partner doesn't allow me to do those things or um, the person I'm in relationship with doesn't so it it takes some work, um, but the work that the work that I'm talking about of it takes some work is the onus is on us as men and masculine folks, right? The responsibility is on us to do it. Whether the people in our lives and the relationships that we are in, whether those folks change, makes make any progress, whether they desire us to do those things, not desire us to do those things. Uh, the, the understanding and the care is that we care enough about those relationships 
and we care enough about the people in our lives to be able to actually do those things and pay attention in that kind of a way, the way that I think all of you have talked about and the care that all of you are talking about that this deeper piece of it, right? So I, I know that Sean talked about that of like the self awareness part of it. It's like that's the, deepening that self awareness and then um, broadening that care uh, mm -hmm. in, in a deeper way, right? So it's like a simultaneous thing, and it's not just a one off thing of like oh. Dang it, pang. That was going to be good. <laughs> You're frozen. There's a profound moment that we just yeah. missed out on. Ah, <laughs> oh, dang, technology. Give it another minute here. All right. Well, Peng, we'll have to hear from you next time, finishing up that thought <laughs> to be continued. Um, so, yeah, we just want to uh, say thank you um, to Seth for taking the time to join us here. I know it's my first time meeting you, and I'm so glad to be able to connect with another guy out there who is trying to care, is, you know, trying to, um, you know, make those changes as an individual and then also looking outward to like how how can we make that change expand and um, really impact the folks that we love as well as all of the people that we don't know and don't you know aren't connected to right just how can we show up in better ways safer ways more um, productive ways as men in mask folks so thanks again, Seth, um, and thank you to all of you who had a chance to tune in live, or if you're watching this after the fact, we appreciate you, and uh, we want to say thank you to our funding partners, Blue Cross Blue Shield of Minnesota, as well as the Novo Foundation for all of their support through these 59 kitchen table conversations as a reminder, these conversations happen every other Thursday at 12 p.m. Central Standard Time right here on Facebook Live. Uh, the next one will be Thursday, June 1st at 12 p.m. And it will be our Pride edition. Uh, we'll be talking about Pride Month and also a little bit about a local event that is happening here in Duluth uh, for the second year in a row called Trans Joy Fest. So you're definitely going to want to tune in to hear about that. And don't forget, like our Facebook page. You can find us on YouTube and watch all of these 59 conversations if you want and you have that time. We would love you to check them out. And if you're interested, like we said in the beginning, we would love to connect with you if there's a subject you'd like a, us to talk about or if you want to come on and, and uh, be a part of this uh, next Kitchen Table conversation, we would uh, welcome you gladly in. So thanks again, all of you on this call, appreciating you and, and those who aren't able to be here, Ed and Roderick. Um, yeah, just deep appreciations and we hope that you all take good care. Until next time.